the others. There's two pairs of small cartels around somewhere. Where are they? Laying around? Look behind the books. No? Uh, well, whatever you got, so. Yai Yaratha Madhava Kunjabi Hani Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Hari, Hari Hari, 
His divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Raj Granta Srimad Bhagavatam Ki, Harinam Sankirtan Ki, Sri Sri Gornatai Ki, Gaur Vimanande, Glories to the Assembled Devotees, Glories to the Assembled Devotees, All Glories to the Assembled Devotees, Glories to Sri Guru and Sri Guranga. <laughs> <coughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we're reading from Canto 2, Chapter 3, Pure Devotional Service. And this is verse number 23, a continuation with the same theme about people who have senses, but they don't use them for the service of the Lord. They're compared to the senses of snakes, peacock eyes, holes in the ground, croaking frogs. So now we go into another area here. This section is really straight on. Tells it like it is. Jiva chavo bhagavatan grivenum Najata martyo biba beta yastu Sri Vishnu padya manujastu lasya Svasanchavo yastuna veda gandam Jeevanchavo yo bhagavan than grin benum Najatu marto be well baited la yastu Sri Vishnu Padhya Manu Jastu Lasya Svasancha Voyastu Navedu Gandham Jeevancha Vobhagavatan Grivainu Najatu Mardya Bila Beta Yastu Sri Vishnu Padya Manu Jastu Lasya Shwasancha Voyastu Naveda Gandam
Ladies? Mm -hmm. Jiwan, while living, Sava, a dead body, Bhagavat Angri Renum, the dust of the feet of a pure devotee, Na, never, Jatu, at any time, Martya, mortal, Abhila Beda, particularly received, Ya, a person, Tu, but, Sri, with opulence, Vishnu Padya, of the lotus feet of Vishnu, Manuja, a descendant of Manu, a man. Tulasya, leaves of the Tulasi tree, not Tulasi, Tulasi, it's not Tulasi, what does you get this word Tulasi from? It's t Tulasi. Tulasi is not the word. Tulasi means two lassies. When you want one lassie, you drink it, and then somebody gives you a second lassie. Tulasi or Tulsi. It's not Tulasi. There's no A, -A there's no emphasis over the A. Everybody says that, oh, Tulasi. It's wrong. <laughs> You're saying something different. It's Tulasi, right? The I, the emphasis is over the I, to la C. So, in 2009, the GBC said, now after all these years of mispronunciation <laughs> of our Sanskrit language, we need to now begin learning how to say it right. So they commissioned Lokanath Swami Maharaj, and he wrote one book, I don't know if you saw it, How to Pronounce. It's a really interesting book, how to pronounce all the mantras. Even the Maha Mantra you pronounce wrong too. So we have to learn the Sanskrit because it's actually, people who know Sanskrit, when they hear you saying it, they, they laugh. And they think, this is funny. <laughs> because there are certain words, if you say it wrong, you're giving a different word completely. <laughs> you know. Just like if you say, instead of saying guro, guro, you say goro. People say to bande goro shri chadanada vindu. You're calling the spiritual master a cow. That's <laughs> basically it. <laughs> and, you know, hare haraye namah krishna, na hare haraya. You say hare haraya, you're saying Lord Shiva. <laughs> so the Sanskrit language is very precise. It must be pronounced properly, so we should learn the actual pronunciation. So for Tulsi, it's the easy way is just say Tulsi, T-U-L-S-I, but it's Tulasi, that's how you say it, when you spell it the long way, Tulasi. Okay, so leaves of the Tulasi plant. Hey, okay. Point one. Swasan. While breathing. Sava. Still a dead body. Ya. Who? Tu. But. Naveda. Never experienced. Gandam. The aroma. Translation. <clears throat> The person who has not at any time received the dust of the feet of the Lord's pure devotee upon his head is certainly a dead body. <laughs> and the person who has never experienced the Roman Roma of the Tulasi leaves from the lotus feet of the Lord is also a dead body, although breathing. <laughs> hmm, two dead bodies here. <laughs> Purport. According to Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, a breathing dead a breathing dead body is a ghost. Interesting. 
When a man dies, he is called dead, but when he again appears in the subtle form, not visible to our present vision, and yet acts, such a dead body is called a ghost. Ghosts are always very bad elements, always creating a fearful situation for others. Similarly, the ghost-like non-devotees, who have no respect for the pure devotees, nor for the Vishnu deity in the temples, create a fearful situation for the devotees at all times. The Lord never accepts any offering from such impure ghosts. <laughs> Prabhupada right to the point. There's a common saying that one should first love the dog of the beloved before one can show any loving sentiment for the beloved. As the stage of pure devotion is attained by sincerely serving a pure devotee of the Lord. The first condition of devotional service to the Lord is therefore to be a servant of a pure devotee. And this condition is fulfilled by the statement, reception of the dust of the lotus feet of the pure devotee who has also served another pure devotee. That is the way of pure disciplic succession or devotional parampara. Maharaj Rahuganath inquired from the great Saint Jad Bhart as to how he had attained such a liberated stage of a Paramahansa. In an answer, the great sage replied as follows, Rahuganait tapasya nayati nacheyaya niva panad grihan va nachandasa naivam jalang, jalangni suryai Vina Mahatpada Rajo Bise come. O King Rahugana, the perfectional stage of devotional service or the Paramahatsa stage of life cannot be attained unless one is blessed by the dust of the feet of great devotees. It is never attained by tapasya, austerity, the Vedic worshipping process, accepting of the rounds the order of life, the discharge of the duties of household life the chanting of Vedic hymns or the performance of the penances in the hot sun within cold water or before in the blazing fire. In other words, Lord Krishna is the property of his pure, unconditional devotees, and as such, only devotees can deliver Krishna to another devotee. Krishna is never obtainable directly. Lord Chaitanya therefore designated himself as Gopi Bartu, the Kamalayor, Dasa Dasa Da Anudas, or the most obedient servant of the servants of the Lord, who maintains the gopi damsels at Braj. A pure devotee therefore never approaches the Lord directly, but tries to please the servant of the Lord's servant, and thus the Lord becomes pleased, and only can they relish the taste of the tulasi leaves stuck to the lotus feet, to his lotus feet. In the Brahma Samhita, it is said that the Lord is never to be found by great, becoming a great scholar of the Vedic literatures, but he is very easily approachable through his pure devotee. In Vrindavan, all the pure devotees pray for the mercy of Srimati Radharani, the pleasure potency of Lord Krishna. Srimati Radharani is the tender-hearted female counter counterpart of the Supreme Whole, resembling the perfectional stage of worldly feminine nature. Therefore, the mercy of Radharani is available very sincerely to the sincere devotees, and once she recommends such a devotee to Lord Krishna, the Lord at once accepts the devotee's admittance into his association. The conclusion is, therefore, that one should be more serious about seeking the mercy of the devotee than that of the Lord directly. And by doing so, by the goodwill of that devotee, the natural attraction for the service of the Lord will be revived. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tatsmai Shri Gurave Maha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste, Saraswati Deve, Gaudavani Pacharine, Nirvishesha Sunyavari, Pasyatya Daisatarine, Pancha Kaupa Taruvishya, Kriva Sindhu Pevacha, Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnave Bio Namaho Namaha, 
Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasiddhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare hmm. Yasya Prashada Bhagavad Prashada Yasya Prashadan Nagati Kutopi so every day in the Mangalarti prayers, the last verse, after glorifying the spiritual master in different ways, uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti ends the prayer by this particular prayer, which is without the mercy of the, the spiritual master, no one can get the mercy of the Lord. And therefore, one has to approach Krishna by approaching his representative. This is the main point that's being made here over and over. Krishna is not so easy to approach. He's neither, neither easy to understand, in fact he's impossible to understand and he's very difficult to approach. But he's easily approachable by one who pleases one who is in, engaged in pure devotional service to him. And therefore a devotee seeks out the shelter and the association of pure devotees. That is the success in one's devotional service. By our own efforts, we cannot make any progress in devotional service. But if the spiritual master or the pure devotee of the Lord recommends you to Krishna or is pleased by your execution of devotional service, then the path to devotional service is wide open. The impediments are automatically removed by the mercy of the great souls. So this is the essence of Krishna consciousness. Guru, approaching Guru, and approaching Guru, but how do we approach the Guru? That's not like we can approach the Guru like we approach any other person. The verse in the Bhagavad Gita clearly gives the understanding. Tadviri pratipatena paripasyena sevaya upadekshyanti te jnanam jnaninas tatpadarshanaham. So in that verse, there are three points that are being made. Paripatena, Pariprasthyena, and Sevaya. So one has to, Paripatena means flat, <laughs> humble, dandavats. This is how one approaches the spiritual master, with great humility. And Pariprasthyena means with inquiry. Asking how, asking how can I, oh, in other words, asking questions that are relevant to the process of devotional service. Not just coming and talking, try to talk nonsense or talking some casual thing. One has to approach the spiritual master in that mood. With humility and with the desire to understand. And then the last one, Sevaya. Sevaya means one has to be ready to carry out the instructions in the form of doing service. Mm -hmm. When these three things are aligned, then one will get the mercy of the Lord through the mercy of the Lord's pure devotee. Now the pure devotee is very merciful, but still, when we approach the pure devotee, we're also approaching the Lord. There's no difference, actually. Because as Prabhupada used the example, when the ambassador... When he comes on behalf of the king, he's giving as much respect as, the, as if the king were personally present. And one who respects that ambassador, the ambassador will go back and also relate to the king exactly how he was treated and what was the discussion. So in the same way, the spiritual master is the, as Prabhupada said, postal peon. He, he is the means by which we get the mercy of the Lord and the full mercy of the Lord. It also says in that same verse, Yasyat Prashada Bhagavat Prashado Yasyat Prashada Naguti Gotopi. Naguti Gotopi means if you try to approach directly, nothing. We can't approach Krishna directly. Although Krishna and the living entities have a direct relationship, but in order to reestablish that relationship, Krishna himself sets up the process. It's not that the spiritual master is setting up the process. Krishna is setting up the process. 
So he speaks that verse in Bhagavad Gita, Tadviri Pratipatena. He's the one that's explaining how we have to approach him through his spiritual master. And therefore, the instructions of the spiritual master becomes the life and soul of the devotee. So much so that there's a beautiful verse from the Sweta Swatara Upanishads, 6.8. Yasya Devi Prada Bhaktir, Yata Devi Tata Guru, Dasyaita Pratite Karta, Prakasanata Mahatmanaha. It says that one who has implicit, if you know that word implicit, that means firm, solid, strong, one who has implicit faith, it's never wavered by situation. In both the spiritual master and the Lord, when one has that strong faith, then it says, the verse goes on to explain, that all the knowledge of all reveals Vedic scriptures are revealed within the heart of that devotee. It's even better than book learning. When you have complete faith in God and, and Krishna, and you're willing to carry out their instructions completely, accordingly, then you have reached perfection in terms of the execution of devotional service. And it's just a matter of time before you reach pure love of God. Even if you don't know so much scripture, that is not a well, disqualification for making advancement. The advancement is that complete faith and complete submission to the instructions of the spiritual master, seeing the spiritual master as being a representative of Krishna, the perfect representative. Then we understand bhakti. <laughs> then bhakti becomes alive. Otherwise, if we minimize the spiritual master's presence or his instructions, as it says in the Ten offenses to the chanting of the holy name. One who disobeys the orders of the spiritual master. That's offense to the holy name. But that statement also has another principle to it. And that is one who minimizes or somehow or other marginalizes the instructions of the spiritual master. Marginalize means, well, these are important and these are not so important. <laughs> I mean, you may follow the ones that you are relevant to you, but you have to understand all the instructions are important because they're coming from the same source. The spiritual master is not a person who has created the philosophy. He's realized the philosophy through practice, and that is called vigyan. Gyan means knowledge, and vigyan means realization of the knowledge through the practice of that knowledge. And so, the example would be given, this is an interesting thing, when Srila Prabhupada used to, sometimes he would sit with his devotees in the evening and he would read his own books to the devotees. Or he would have his devotees read his books. And they would be reading Krishna book stories. And so Prabhupada would be hearing a story of one of the pastimes. And maybe it was some humorous thing of Krishna doing something that was funny. And Prabhupada would laugh <laughs> when he would hear the story of Krishna being narrated in that way. And then, and then even he would listen very absorbed and he would sometimes comment. And later he would say, uh, I'm not writing these books. These are Krishna's words. I'm simply putting them on paper. Krishna speaking, I'm writing. So that's what it means to be a pure devotee, to be a perfect receptacle for the mercy of Krishna in the form of the knowledge that Krishna gives. Sometimes one person asks, Prabhupada, do you know everything? And Prabhupada's answer was, I'm not God. But I know what I need to know. <laughs> what does that mean? He knows how to engage his devotees in devotional service where they can make advancement on the path of devotional service. And that's what it means that the spiritual master has full knowledge. He has full knowledge on how to guide the devotee back home, back to Godhead. Why? Because Krishna gives him that knowledge. Krishna inspires that person to 
to understand how best to make the, to help his disciples go back home back to Godhead. That's the knowledge that Krishna gives directly. And that comes in the form of practical guidance, how to live your life, and two, the philosophical knowledge of the, of the scriptures. So Guru gives both practical guidance, how to execute devotional service, and how to understand the, the philosophy as is coming from Krishna through the scriptures, mostly through scripture, or through the great saints. So full faith in the spiritual master is, uh, is actually the most powerful principle of bhakti. If we doubt our spiritual master, or if we marginalize our spiritual master, if we don't think it's important developing that relationship with the spiritual master, we will not be able to really make much progress in devotional service, very little. Because the spiritual master, as Prabhupada said, is by nature very kind. And therefore, when he sees someone sincere, he's inspired to give more and more understanding. The sincerity of the devotee inspires the spiritual master to give more and more guidance and more and more knowledge, more and more understanding of the philosophy. If the devotee is not so sincere, then, as Prabhupada said, the spiritual master may speak or may, he may not speak. He may speak or may not speak. He's not obliged to speak. It's up to him whether he can speak or not speak. And therefore, if he dies, decides not to speak, that means he's not inspired by the, the, by the devotion of that person. But when he sees, oh, that person is eager, they like to serve, they ask questions, they want to learn, they, they want clarification, then the spiritual master said, oh, and then he opens up more and more and more. And that's Krishna coming through the spiritual master because Krishna is bringing that person closer to him through the mercy of the spiritual master by the instructions that he gives, Krishna gives directly like that. Here it also mentions Srimati Radharani, how she is Prem Guru. <laughs> Lord Nityananda, Balaram, he is Guru Tattva. But Radharani, she's Prem Guru. She gives bhakti to Vrindavan. To approach Radharani directly is not also not very easy or possible. We approach Radharani through the process of devotional service. But Prabhupada says you can pray to Radharani. And because she is, as he says, tender-hearted female counterpart of the Supreme Whole. whole. In other words, Radharani is very soft-hearted. And because she's very soft-hearted, she's inclined to give Krishna's mercy to others. So for one prays sincerely to Srimati Radharani, begging for her mercy, Srimati Radharani, if she's pleased with that devotee, she recommends them to Krishna. And if she recommends them to Krishna, as Prabhupada says, then at once, at once the, the, the devotee's admittance becomes allowed into his association. So we have the mercy of Lord Nityananda, we have the mercy of Srimati Radharani, and we have the mercy of our spiritual master. These are manifestations of the Lord's mercy coming in different forms. So um, this whole process is really learning how to beg for the mercy, learning how to cry for the mercy, learning how to seek out the mercy. Uh, just like it says that the, there's a, a bird, which is called a swan. A swan can come to a, a container that has a mixture of water and milk together, mixed together, and drink only the milk and leave the water. Special feature of this bird. So, at the same time, the devotees, they, can, they are nectar seekers. They go for the nectar. They don't go for the garbage that everyone else is interested in. They go for the nectar. And the nectar is to get more and more understanding of the process of devotional service and how to apply that knowledge in the day-to-day -day life so I can make progress to go back home, back to Godhead. 
We're not so much interested in arranging so many things in our material lives. Well, I have to live here, I have to get this, I have to be here, I have to do this, I have to learn this kind of instrument, I have to do that. I have to. These are extras, these are secondary. And they're nice, but the real success of one's devotional service is to continually hear from the spiritual master. And whenever it is possible, to get clarification through the process of questions. Understand those answers, apply those answers, and make progress back home, back to God. That's the main thing for a devotee, to always be connected to that sound vibration coming from the Krishna through his pure representative. Just like I was just reading the GBC minutes of the, the previous uh, uh, GBC meeting this year. They just posted them. And one of the things that there's a big concern is people are not reading Prabhupada's books. It's, and it's been going on for years. People just don't read Prabhupada's books. Even some of the leaders don't read. We did a survey a couple years ago at the SGGS, what was it? SG, not the SGGS, but uh, the ILS. ILS meaning the in, 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 ISKCON Leadership Sangha in Mayapur, and all the leaders were there. It was 259 of us in the meeting. So they wanted to take a survey, so they had a written survey, and it had a listing of Prabhupada's books. How many times did you read this book in your life? How many times did you read Bhagavad Gita? How many times did you read Srimad Bhagavatam? So then they took uh, and they and we all filled out our forms, turned it in, they added it up, and then they divided it by the number of people to get the average. So it was less than one percent for Chaitanya Charitamrita. <laughs> in other words, n not if you had to add it all up, mm, each person haven't hasn't reached one time reading Chaitanya Charitamrita. Bhagavad Gita was a little better, and Srimad Bhagavatam was in between. Prahlad Nanda Maharaj, your GVC here, he read a he's read Bhagavad Gita 130 times. <laughs> Prahlad Nanda Maharaj is like he reads all the time. He's reading Prabhupada's books constantly. In fact, he has a whole series of books that he reads every day in the same order for hours. Although he has so many responsibilities as a GBC and others, he, he takes so much time for reading Prabhupada's books. So the GBC were really concerned that devotees are not reading Prabhupada's books. So they decided to make a reading week seminar coming up this year. So from September 3rd to September 9th is reading Srila Prabhupada's seminar book reading week. <laughs> so they want devotees all around the world to have seminars on reading Srila Prabhupada's books, at least for that week. But that's a long way off, September. So why not start now <laughs> in terms of reading? So take some time and read Prabhupada's books. I was even thinking this morning that we should in make that a requirement for initiation now. Just like we ask people to chant 16 rounds and follow the four regulative principles. I was thinking that would be a good in to now make it that you promise to read Prabhupada's books at least one hour every day and when you take your initiation vows. Of course, they haven't instituted that as a formal thing, but I think that's optional with the spiritual masters. Because I've seen spiritual masters do add other principles to the initiation vows, such as um, staying chaste to ISKCON, not going outside of ISKCON, and other things that they have added also. So it's so important to read Prabhupada's books, because uh, Prabhupada put his whole life in giving us this knowledge. The time he wrote the books was the time everybody was sleeping. 
he would start writing around 12.30 in the evening, and, and, and night when everyone's sleeping, and he would go on for hours through the night, giving the Bhaktivedanta purports. He would do it everywhere he went, practically every night. And uh, sometimes he would even wake up his devotees and ask them about certain things that he was writing, just to get some ideas from them. So Prabhupada put, he, he wanted to give us Srimad Bhagavatam. He gave us 13 chapters up to the, through the 13th, through the 10th canto, like that. It's unfortunate he didn't finish the Bhagavatam. But he did give us Chaitanya Charitamrita, Bhagavad Gita, Nectar of Devotion, Sri Upanishads, Nectar of Instructions, and so many other books that he also authored. And so we have like a, this wealth of transcendental knowledge that's available. And when you're fixed in transcendental knowledge, you don't fall down. <laughs> Devotees fall down because they just don't know how to execute devotional service. When you know the process, you can understand what to avoid and what to accept, like that. And that comes by hearing from Prabhupada and hearing from uh, Prabhupada through his books directly. Yesterday I was in a little discussion on my conference and one of the one of the devotees said, well, I like to go on YouTube, and I go through YouTube, and I, re I hear these different lectures given on YouTube. She said, is, is that okay? I said, no. <laughs> I, said, I said, you have to understand Prabhupada, because if you don't understand Prabhupada, you won't understand his movement. Really, you won't. You won't understand his movement unless you hear from Prabhupada regularly. And besides that, what Prabhupada says is full of the most amazing statements he makes. Some of them are so amazing that you think, well, I have to remember that. I should never forget that one. So I'm going to ask you, how many of you are reading every day some, some of Prabhupada's books? Zero. Little. How many of you are at least hearing Prabhupada's lectures every day? Oh boy. Well, welcome to the Hare Krishna movement. So this is the Hare Krishna movement means that this is, so it's all about Srila Prabhupada. That's what it means. To become Krishna conscious means to become Prabhupada conscious. That's what it takes. <laughs> Otherwise, how, how will we understand Krishna? It's not possible. If we don't understand Krishna, at least to a certain degree, then the path of devotional service becomes practically impossible. <laughs> so yeah, we need to have this knowledge, not only for ourselves, but to also to benefit others when we have the opportunity. So it's important that we hear from the pure devotee, inquire from the pure devotee, and also uh, speak the message that the pure devotee gives to us, to others. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll stop there. Okay. Hare Krishna, thank you for the lecture. Uh, you're speaking about uh, considering all instruction of the spiritual master on the same level, or, or important, but better to say. So I, for a long time I have this problem, I would like to somehow see it from your point of view. When we read Prabhupada's letters, uh, conversations, morning walks, and different uh, stories from the senior devotees, then we hear a lot of instructions from Srila Prabhupada. And then, when we associate with the devotees, then we see they are not following them <laughs> a lot of times. And that there could be really simple things. For example, you can see a lot of devotees saying, uh, Rade, Rade, when they say hello. And Prabhupada explicitly 
as I understand, said not to say like that, or he was having something uh, against it. So for a yeah, he wanted to make Radharani's name cheap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for a beginner like me, it could be confusing because all there is a lot of details in Prabhupada's instructions how to perform kirtans, bhajans, how to this, how to that, and then when it happens, it's not like that, then a beginner could be, become confused and criticize that person which is doing it. And for a long time I was criticizing, and I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be somehow... <laughs> but it's mm -hmm. very hard, because a lot of devotees are not following some... Yeah, it kind of makes you, when you know what's right and you see it's not being done, you become unhappy, unhappy at least. <clears throat> like... When I used to go to, you know, <clears throat> when I go to the arties, and I see how devotees do function during the arti ceremonies, I also get a little bit concerned. <clears throat> they don't follow the etiquette properly, like that. So we not only the knowledge, but the practical application in terms of how to execute devotional service. As they say, Behavior is higher than precept. You can know everything, but if your behavior is not good, you won't, you, know, you won't be able to attract the attention of the Lord. Proper behavior is, the, is called achar. We have sadachar, achar, and prachar. Prachar means, you know, knowledge. Sadachar is the etiquette, and the behavior is achar. <coughs> So one has to learn, now, yeah, so, and then, of course people pick up things from other areas and throw it into it, like that. There's a lot of stuff that goes on that shouldn't go on, and there's stuff that should go on that doesn't go on. And we can, you know, we can mention so many of the different things that Prabhupada said. Like that. Especially when it comes to temple worship, like that. So, yeah, I feel the same way you do. <laughs> and sometimes, you, and you, you can't go around correcting people all the time. It's just, you know, that's not our business to go around going around correcting people. And therefore, we give classes and have seminars so people will learn and ask questions to get an understanding of how to do things and not only to what is the philosophy like that. Of course, when you have a, a temple president, then that temple president must make sure everything goes on nicely within the temple. He's the one that has to do the correcting or through his representatives. They can do that. But each of us, if we take the position of correcting everybody, then it becomes really awkward and can it also become offensive too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I agree with you in terms of, you know, it is, it is disturbing, but what can you do? You can just, you know, if you can find the opportunity to correct it in such a way that it works, then, but then usually a lot of times it just doesn't, the opportunity for doesn't doesn't present itself. Just like when we pay our obeisances. How do we pay our obeisances? Prabhupada said, not this hatchet. You know what a hatchet is? You know what a you know what an axe is for cutting wood. And a hatchet is a small axe, a hand ha a hand axe like this. It's an axe, but it's it's used in your hand. That's called a hatchet. Yeah, a big one like that. That's an axe. When you put it in your hand, it's a hatchet, small one. So a hatchet goes choo choo. So pe people pay their obeisances like that. <laughs> So Prabhupada said, not like that, it's not, not hatchet. <laughs> Tutu. You go down and you chant the prayer to your spiritual master. That's obeisances. With your head touching the floor. 
There's two kinds of obeisances. There's five point and eleven point. Five point means five parts of the body touch the floor. Two hands, two knees, and the the head, like that. Or the feet also. And the eleven point means dandavats. So the ladies don't pay dandavats, they do the regular obeisances, and the men can do either one. So that's etiquette. And that's important. Krishna also makes that point in the Bhagavad Gita. Offering your homage to me means offering your obeisances to me, like that. Offering your prayers to me. So paying obeisances is a very, very big part of our process. We either don't do it, or we bounce our head off the floor like we don't have time, or it hurts, maybe it hurts our back to go down too long. <laughs> so, <laughs> whatever. So, but that's not in Krishna consciousness means, you know, obeisances. At least in the temple, anyway. That we should do. Maybe outside we go like this. But when we're here in the temple, it should always be done properly. The Lord is here, the spiritual master is here. So everything should be done nicely. So yeah, there's so many things. <laughs> Another thing is we do in the RT, which I'll just mention one more, so we is that when we get the ghee lamp, we pass the ghee lamp around and then the, the last then the man who has the ghee lamp, he goes over and hands it to the Mataji. And then she takes it and passes it around. That's against etiquette. You don't give it to the ladies. You put it somewhere and then a lady will come and pick it up. You can't hand it to the ladies. That's against the etiquette. In like that. Either the flower, the pot of water, or the, uh, the ghee lamp, you don't hand to the ladies. You just put it somewhere where they can see it and the ladies pick it up and then they do it to the ladies. That's etiquette also, and that's been given to us. There's so many things, things that are important for our execution of temple etiquette and like that. So yeah, so when you're in Vrindavan and you're in Barsana, you can say Radhe Radhe. <laughs> but when and generally we say Hare Krishna when we greet each other like that. Sometimes we say Hare Wo, but like that, but or Jai Prabhu, or Hare Krishna Mataji, like that. So that's proper. Kash Maharaj is here, then uh, he corrects everyone, and we have a little bit fear of him. <laughs> he even will stop uh, this um, uh, puja, and he said, no, no, don't do that, uh, sit properly, and uh, in morning when it's um, Mangalarati, who will sing, uh, uh, can you sing, can you sing, because everyone is afraid, because he will correct you, how properly sing, and actually we appreciate this, because uh, most of us, we not know what we are doing wrong. Because after sometimes uh, we forget it's standard or uh, we even not know. Example, I was coming to him and um, with this water, uh, I just put my finger and in his head he said, don't put a finger, just do like this. And so many small things he teaches us um, yeah. what never I hear before. Yeah. I can do the same thing, but I, don't, the, but I don't. But I know you don't listen to me, so I don't do it. <laughs> That's my experience. <laughs> yeah, there's all these things that are there, like that. And, it's, you know, like, sometimes they give you the flower and they put the flower on your head first and then they give it to your nose. Like, what is, who came up, come up with that idea? It's like <laughs> when we used to do the water, we never, we'd, we would never go from person to person with the water, right? You remember the old days? The, the, the pujari from the altar would throw the water. They still do it in India. 
They throw it, and you, if you get hit with it, you're lucky. If you don't, then... <laughs> That's the way they do it in India. They still do it like that. So yeah, it's the, the etiquette is important, behavior is important, all these things. If you want, when I'm here, I can give you a seminar on Vaishnava etiquette. <clears throat> we can do it, like maybe for a weekend. And because we have etiquette in different categories. I have, we have at least 10 to 15 different categories which you can, we can explain behavior and etiquette in. Like that. But the most important principle is humility. If a devotee is humble, then they both learn, and even if they make a mistake, it's not so, bad, not so serious if one is humble. Humble means they're willing to and take instructions and learn if there's some mistake. Yeah, when you're singing, Prabhupada was very serious about Mangal Arti. <clears throat> there has to be the Mangal Arti tune. If it's not Prabhupada, you have to sing the Mangal Arti tune or else Prabhupada would stop you. <clears throat> and he wanted only Hare Krishna for Mangal Arti. That's all. No other mantras except the Guru mantras and the Panchatattva mantra. And then at the end you can chant like the name of Sri Deity, Jai Gornitai or Jai, you know, Sri Sri Radha, Madan Mohan, like that. Maybe one mantra at the end like that. But Prabhupada said, Hari, Mangal Arti means all Maha Mantra. <clears throat> In the right melody also. There's the morning melody. And there's the evening melody. You have to know the different melodies. There is an evening melody too. Sometimes devotees sing the evening melody during the morning time. Mm -hmm. So all these things, we were all taught at the beginning when we joined the Hare Krishna movement. Prabhupada was there to instruct us and then the senior devotees learned and the senior devotees instructed us. So we got everything directly from either Prabhupada or through Prabhupada's representative. Now, unless the, the senior devotees teach and the, and the younger devotees want to learn, we'll definitely make mistakes. So that's why we should have classes in etiquette also. Mm -hmm. When Prabhupada was, one lady was talking to Prabhupada and, uh, you know, she was explaining this man's philosophy. Prabhupada said, well, what is his behavior? Because <laughs> behavior is more important than philosophy. Behavior is the ornament of a devotee, how the devotee acts in each and every situation. is actually the quality of a Vaishnava. Hmm. And sometimes we get a little friendly and go a little bit outside of the normal behavior, that's not so, what we say, that's not an offense or anything. But in temple, and in course in certain parts of the worship, the etiquette has to be followed carefully, especially in the temple. Mm -hmm. Like that. Like if you're sitting like this in the temple, that's an offense. Can't sit like that before the deities. People do that, or you stretch your legs out. That's another way you can't sit. <laughs> if you can't sit cross-legged, sit in a chair. <laughs> That's fun. That's also allowed like that. Some of us have problems with the legs, so it's hard to sit. So we have the chairs. <laughs> and if the chairs are too far away, bring the chairs close. You can Bring the chairs right up to the front here. So well, yeah, so there's so much we can speak about. But if you'd like, maybe in the in the upcoming weekends, we can do a, a whole thing on Vaishnav etiquette. If we can get a, 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 a what we say a regular attendance with the devotees, I'd be happy to do it. <clears throat> 
Hmm? Well, this weekend is a little full because we have a f program in in Zagreb during the on Sunday. The following weekend is good, and that'll give you enough time to publicize it. Also, you can put it on the uh, you know on the media. I did it in Bosnia. I was meant to give it for three days. I wound up giving it for seven days. The devotees liked it a lot. All my lectures are recorded, yeah. But then again, you can also... Bhakti Churu Maharaj is Mr. Vaishnava etiquette. And he has not only spoken about it, but he's also put it in print. There's one pamphlet and written by Bhakti Churu Maharaj about Vaishnava etiquette. Yeah. Okay, so we'll stop here. It's getting close to breakfast time. And thank you very much. Tomorrow's verse is a really powerful verse. I'm actually looking forward to reading, giving it, speaking on that one. Okay, so Srila Prabhupada Ki. Srila Prabhupada, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki, Gaur Primanande, Sisi Gaur Nathai Ki Jai. Thank you.